Good morning. Um, as Vernon said, I got my master's here in history. I was actually recruited into the program from my bachelor's in accounting by the late Dr. Alan Schaffer and Theda Purdue, and they told me they thought I'd make a great lawyer or a great historian. I picked historian, doesn't pay as much money, but it is gratifying in other ways. Um, when I was a graduate student here, we had a conference. I think it dealt with slavery in the South. It was organized by Dr. Carol Blesser. And one of the things that I can remember about that conference was that she introduced C. Van Woodward. And I don't remember if he was her um, advisor or just uh, an informal mentor, but I just remember the look on her face. And she was really glowing uh, when she had that honor to introduce him. So even though you may not be able to tell, I'm glowing right now as I get ready to introduce my own advisor. And I actually met her here for the first time. I don't know if she remembers it when she came here and she spoke in Tillman Hall. She was at Purdue at the time. It's a lot of things I remember about her, perhaps she doesn't know. Darlene Clark Hine is a John A. Hanna Professor of History at Michigan State University and the Board of Trustees Professor Emerita of African American Studies at Northwestern University. She was awarded the National Endowment of Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama in 2014. She has served as president of the Southern Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians. She is the co-editor with Dwight McBride of New Black Studies series at the University of Illinois Press. Hine is the author of Black Victory, The Rise and Fall of the White Primary, which you were talking about when you came to Clemson those many years ago and of black women and white racial conflict and cooperation in the nursing profession. So without per further ado, please welcome Dr. Darlene clark -Hine. Thank you. I didn't want to start without saying thank you. And you've been a dear friend for decades. So how could I say no when you approached me with this wonderful opportunity to um, participate in this conference? It's a conference unlike any other I've attended. And I've been so impressed with all of my colleagues and their presentations. And I just hope that we have a spirited conversation after I finish my remarks. I want to um, talk about, um, let, me go through, let me go through the slides first, okay? To give you, to give all of us a, a sense of who I'm talking about and what these people look like. I've been working on, on this particular project for about 20 years now. I've been collecting all the information I could possibly collect about that first generation of black physicians, black lawyers, and trying to develop a theory, you know, a perspective on the professionalization process and what it meant to black people, especially during the collapse of Reconstruction, the age of Jim Crow, how did black people survive? And were there thoughts or, or belief systems or ideologies that they all adhered to? And this has been, um, a long and arduous task. First head of a hospital and nurse training school here in um, Charleston, South Carolina, was Anna DaCosta Banks. And Anna DaCosta Banks helped a group of black uh, male physicians to found the hospital, and she established a nursing school and one of the reasons the hospital and the nursing school survived was that Anna DaCosta Banks cultivated very warm and rewarding relationships with all the wealthy white women in Charleston. So right from the outset, I'm, I just have to lay it out that there was a layer of cooperation between white women and black women in the professional arena, but also uh, uh, as 
assistants and servants. So, and, and many of the black women that I'm going to talk about had very uh, cordial and beneficial, mutually beneficial relationships with white women. And Anna DaCosta Banks was probably the most important black woman health professional in Charleston uh, throughout, up until she died, uh, up until the end of World War uh, II. One of the things that was very surprising to me when I first started doing this, work, this research was to discover this publication. From the outset, black uh, physicians and, and there were only about four or five of them in uh, Charleston. They needed to have some kind of publication in order to share with the larger community what it was they were doing and why, and to solicit help. But what's really important about this publication is the photograph of a, sur a surgery that they were performing. Um, and they used photographs like this on just about every uh, issue of this journal. And this was a way of connecting with the black community, but also uh, assuring the white community that they weren't doing anything really dangerous. They were really just trying to save people's lives. And it was a way of raising money to support the, um, the facility. Now the hospital had a training school. The training school, this is another way, I'm, I'm doing the economics first because you had to make, you had to raise a lot of money to support this, this facility. And Anna DaCosta Banks started that nursing training school and the nurses, stu the nursing students were often um, allowed to work for some of the prominent white families in the community and provide nursing care, services, what have you. And then the white women would pay the nursing students and that money would help to support the hospital. This is the second um, black woman that I focused on in addition to Anna uh, DaCosta Banks. Uh, Matilda Evans was the first black woman to become a surgeon, to pass the medical, uh, to receive her medical degree, and to open up a practice in Columbia, uh, South Carolina. And she was really important, again, in terms of providing, uh, getting the state, getting important people within the community who had a lot of resources but didn't want to give it to black folks, but they would give it to her because she was, she would provide medical services for them and she was extraordinarily discreet. Um, and I need to say no more about the discretion but a lot of white women, especially wealthy white women, paid her fees, and that enabled her to treat all black women and their children, especially the poor, free of charge. And why did white women seek her services? I underlined it again and again. She was very discreet. You can't understand Dr. Evans without appreciating Martha Schofield. Uh, Martha Schofield was one of those um, abolitionists, if you will, who came from Philadelphia during the Reconstruction era, established a school in Aiken, South Carolina, and for, for uh, black people, black kids, you, you name it. But she used to travel around the countryside in a buggy with a 
horse-driven country, uh, horse-driven buggy. And she spotted this one girl and asked her parents if she could take the child back to Columbia um, to educate her, you know, to, or to, the, to the school to take care of her. And, and the parents said, no, uh, you just can't walk up into my yard and ask to take the child. Uh, but Martha Schofield would not give up, and she persisted. And every time she had a free moment, she'd get in that little buggy with the horse and, and ride over to this farm and ask the parents if they would allow her to take the daughter to school so she could educate her. And eventually, she wore them down, and they agreed to do so. And so they sent her to the school. Um, and after she graduated from the little school, um, um, Martha Schofield made arrangements so that she could attend college. She went to Oberlin. Uh, after she finished three years at Oberlin, she returned to Shellfield School and decided that she wanted to become a physician. And Martha Shellfield had contacts in Pennsylvania. She contacted a, a, another benefactor and arranged for her to get a scholarship. And so for three years, she went there, she studied and didn't have to pay any fees, if you will, and returned to South Carolina, established her practice in Columbia, uh, remained very close to Martha Schofield, and wrote the first book that I was able to, to locate about one of the abolitionists who had come south to help the freedmen. And this is a historical and philosophical review of the Reconstruction period of South Carolina by Dr. Matilda Evans. This is her hospital. The same pattern prevails. She opened the hospital, established a practice, and was able to open a nursing training school in the hospital um, to provide opportunities for a whole new generation of black uh, women. But there was something else that was really quite unique about this hospital. Black people couldn't really attend or enter the hospital most of the patients that she accepted were white. She established very cordial relations with white businessmen uh, in the city who you know, wanted someone to repair the injuries of their workmen, working on the railroads, working you know, in, the, in the lumber industry throughout. So she was able then to earn money to support the training of the nurses, to create uh, opportunities for them, for black, that did not exist anywhere else except down in Charleston. But she was also able to treat black people, black patients, free of charge. Uh, for any ailments or issues they had. And that was very good. The businessmen supported her because she healed their workers. The white women uh, supported her because she was discreet. After a few years, she became a leader in the black professional community in South, uh, in, in Colombia. And one of the things that she 
and all of these black professionals now um, fought for that gained her international and national attention. She believed that health care was a right. Health care was as important a civil right as was the right to vote and the right to an education. And so those were the three pillars of her mission. You know, she believed that if people were truly to be free, that they needed access to health care, education, and the vote. And that became the unifying theme of her entire life. Now let me just read some of this very quickly, okay. <laughs> I'm not on the clock. Let me go back. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. Second quote. In the face of tyranny, a band of patriots brought an empire to its knees. In the face of secession, we unified a nation and set the captives free. In the face of depression, we put people back to work and lifted millions out of poverty. We welcome immigrants to our shores. We opened railroads to the West. We landed a man on the moon, and we heard king, kings call to let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That was Barack Obama, February 10th, 2007. On February 10th, 2007, with his wife and two daughters at his side, in front of the State House in Springfield, Illinois, Barack Obama launched his campaign for the office of the President of the United States. This most unlikely candidate achieved an historic and improbable, uh, historic improbable, becoming the first president of the United States of African descent. On January 20th, 2009, 20 months from the outset of that audacious statement or announcement, Obama placed his hand on the same Bible, the one that Abraham Lincoln had used in March 4th, 1861, to pledge to uphold the Constitution of the United States. After freedom, after freedom, African Americans, especially uh, in the South, believed that there was going to be significant changes in their lives. But one of the things that no one could have predicted, well, maybe some could, <laughs> was that freedom would be very fleeting. In the 1890s, and, and I'm setting this up because this black professional class has to be put in this context. With Plessy v. Ferguson, with the nullification or attempted nullification uh, of, of the rights of black people, especially those who are trying to get an education, trying to pursue business opportunities, the rise of lynching, and what have you. Um, Rayford Logan described that period as the nadir. 
that that was the area, a period when black people were very uh, desperate. And what they needed was this black professional class. So in the 1930s, between the, that period and the 1930s, Carter G. Woodson, however, was very, very um, insistent that what black people needed was a black professional class and Negro professional men. And that's the, the, the two pillars that I work with then. You know, Sassy B. Ferguson, Ida B. Wells in the lynching, anti-lynching crusade, the devastation, the attempts to return black people to the state of uh, despair. And then you had Dr. Evans fighting to save black people's lives. You had um, Anna da Costa Banks securing money, all the money she could to keep the hospital open, and you had um, educators fighting to improve the lives and opportunities of their children. Um, so let me go back. Martha Schofield joined a hand of the band of teachers, ministers, and reformers who during the Civil War shaped the Port Royal experiment. She traveled to Guatemala, Edisto Island, and St. Helens before settling inland at Aiken. An ardent believer in peace, women's suffrage, and temperance, she established in 1868 the Schofield Normal and Industrial School. She boarded black children and organized programs for local adult citizens. The school's motto was, not for ourselves alone. In 1868, Schofield wrote, whether the freedmen can be elevated to a high place for Christian citizenship is no longer an open question. While all three women were determined to exhaust whatever strategies and appeals deemed necessary to save black lives, to provide quality education, and to agitate for fundamental citizenship rights. In addition to uh, Schofield and, and Mark Callan, um, Anna de Costa Banks, and Dr. Evans, there were a number of other African-American women who were trying to provide health care services and educational opportunities to black people. This is Matilda Evans. Um, and this is the resplendent Matilda Evans out of scrubs. And this is the Matilda Evans that organized the black community to try and force the state of South Carolina to provide health care, uh, free health care to all the black citizens in Columbia, South Carolina. And she mobilized all of the health care providers, all of the professional workers. She opened her house and held meetings and brought everybody together to demand that the state, the Secretary of State, put up money so that every, all the poor black people in South Carolina could get inoculations, could get health care um, operations, you name it. Of course, there was a great deal of resistance. Uh, the Secretary of State was not at all interested in providing African Americans uh, this free health care. And this is where the white women come in and the discretion that she had cultivated. And they then, with their power, one by one, went to their husbands and the secretary and behind the scenes said, 
that they thought it would be a very good idea for the Secretary of State to open up or to support a, a health care clinic in Columbia, South Carolina. And the state Secretary of State did it. And they opened up, they, they went around the city and they established these uh, clinics, opened up clinics. All the doctors in South Carolina, black physicians, whatever, came to Columbia. And on the first day that the clinics opened, so to speak, 700 people showed up and were inoculated, vaccinated, um, bones were set. They were given dental work. All of the all of the male physicians. Now she's the only woman. All of the male physicians in South Carolina came together to uh, support this healthcare clinic, and it was the first time that black people could come and have their bones set. Everything was done, and there were different locations all over the South. Um, that was Matilda Evans' attempt to preserve freedom, all right? To preserve freedom, a freedom for healthcare. The second thing she did after uh, negotiating with them for the healthcare clinic, mobilizing all the black physicians at least once a year, uh, once every few months to come together to give their services free. White physicians as well could help set the bones what have you. Um, after she did that, the Matilda Evans became head of a group of black women in the, in the community and began to organize um, ways to adopt children who were abandoned or children who had parentage uh, that no one would claim, so to speak. And, I, and that's euph euphemistically saying when black women were raped in homes uh, as domestics or what have you and had children, then white women would ask Dr. Evans to take care of the problem, quote unquote. And Dr. Evans was able to establish uh, facilities in the city to help keep these children uh, healthy and alive. I mean, so there's all kinds of different things going on in, in South Carolina with this particular practice. Um, but she also had time to look good. <laughs> And she was known uh, across the region for that kind of generosity. So let me move on from Dr. Evans then. This is Iona Rollins Whipper. Now, many of you know about the Whippers. Oh, you're saying you don't know about the Whippers. <laughs> um, the Whippers during the Reconstruction era, black family, uh, very prominent. He was one of the first elected officers off, uh, to political office uh, in South Carolina. Um, the Wallen sisters were very prominent in Reconstruction circles. They were uh, quite um, uh, socialites, if you will. It was, a, it was a high moment in their lives. But after the Reconstruction uh, failed, one of the Rollins sisters moved to Washington, D.C., collapsed, whatever, and produced a daughter who took it upon herself to try and provide support after she received her medical degree for women, regardless of race, who needed help with their children, unwed mothers. And she built the first unwed mother's home, a home for unwed mothers in Washington, DC. It became a model for uh, homes 
like that across the country. Uh, and she was a South Carolina uh, woman. Let's go on. This is the home. It is now, you know, it's over 100 years old, but it is now for uh, girls who've been abused. So, still operating. Jane Etna Hunter. Jane Etna Hunter was one of the women that received her nursing training in that hospital school uh, in, in Charleston that I talked about, Anna DaCosta Banks. She, gradu she didn't graduate, she left before she graduated, but that was her first formal education, so to speak. She left, she went to Cleveland, Ohio, and opened up the Phyllis Wheatley Homes, a home for working girls, Again, migrants who are coming into the city, no place to stay. She developed this whole concept of a working girl's home. Um, she herself became very active in Republican politics, but by the time that she died, there was this very substantial um, residence and business operation, and she had accumulated almost a million dollars. Um, one of these true up from slavery, again, kind of, kind of story. Again, trying to support and look after black women and especially those who were disadvantaged. Uh, and it still stands today. It's like a YMCA, but it's called uh, a Phyllis Sweetly home. And she sold the book and uh, again, raised money. When uh, she died, it's worth over half a million dollars. Uh, so the point that I've been trying to make throughout this whole rambling conversation is that black women did not simply sit back and let freedom disappear. <laughs> Uh, to let their lives end without accomplishment. They tried to do something to preserve the freedom in spite of the rising tide of lynching, in spite of the separate but unequal, in spite of the Jim Crow system. They used all the resources that they had to try and make life better for other African-American women and their families. And these, all of these women are part of the South Carolina story that to this date, uh, no one has really taken seriously and, and developed uh, in the broad sense a narrative of how Black women tried to make freedom real and to sustain it by providing health care, educational opportunities, and educational uh, access, uh, and of course, safety and support and when they made mistakes or when violence almost disrupted their lives. That's the legacy, one of the legacies of black women in South Carolina during and after Reconstruction. And I wish only that someone, maybe some of the graduate students in this room, would continue the investigation of black women's contributions to South Carolina history and culture. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nis Nicholas Gaffney. He is an assistant professor of history and the associate dean of social sciences and humanities at Northern Virginia Community College in Alexandria. He holds his PhD from the University of Illinois, 
We already heard about that guy he studied with, and he has a master's in African and African American studies from Ohio State University. Where uh, I know someone, Cherise Jones Branch, who got her degree there. He teaches courses in American and African American history, and he researches 20th century African American activism with an emphasis on the relationship between arts and black social movements. Hi, good morning, and thank you for that introduction, which is absolutely accurate. Uh, being kind of pulled through uh, graduate school by my coattails. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I do want to say, just take a moment to say thank you to Peter, uh, to Vernon, uh, to George Ann for organizing such a wonderful conference. Uh, very happy to be here. And I think the conference itself really reflects one of the, the things I've learned working under Vernon, uh, just beyond a study of history, and that's how important the idea of community is. Uh, I've really had a chance to enjoy uh, being a part of the community that's here of scholars and just watching the relationships build. And so that's one of the life lessons I've kind of taken away from working under him. So I thank you uh, for that. An extremely generous advisor, uh, generous enough to allow me to come here and present what's perhaps the, the first uh, paper given about jazz at a Lincoln conference. <laughs> it may, may be the last. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> so the <laughs> okay, now I'm just, I'll just go off the paper. Uh, so no PowerPoints or anything like that. No music either, I guess, to disappoint. Uh, but after the talk of my title is The Jazz Tradition and the Sound of Lincoln's Pragmatic New Beginning. After hearing the title of my talk, I have no doubt that you are all asking yourselves, what does Abraham Lincoln have to do with jazz? Indeed, that's a fair question. Uh, jazz is a distinctly 20th century cultural phenomenon, and Lincoln was absolutely the 19th century, perhaps the greatest American president. Chronologically speaking, Lincoln's 1865 assassination predates the birth of jazz by about 30 years. The musicians credited for helping to create jazz, musicians like uh, cornetist Buddy Bolden, uh, pianist Charlie Roll Morton, were decades away from being born in the moment uh, Bruce uh, Bullet ripped Lincoln from the world. While indeed a lover of music, Lincoln would have never had the opportunity to hear the first blued note of early jazz music. So again, the question of what does Abraham Lincoln have to do with jazz is completely fair. Because on the surface, uh, framed in terms of the material existence of Lincoln and jazz as agents within the world, the answer to that question is nothing. They're really not connected together. So I can end the paper there, but I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, because that's OK. <laughs> because this conference is not about the work that Lincoln accomplished while he physically existed in the world. The theme of this conference is about what comes next. Uh, this conference is about the unfinished and the yet to be completed work following Lincoln's physical existence in this world. So to slightly tweak or kind of riff off of the question, what does Abraham Lincoln's unfinished work have to do with jazz? And I'm here to suggest that it has everything to do with jazz. Jazz, as an American multiracial plural cultural institution, and the story of its evolution from a music that was, quote, that was dismissed as, quote, naked African rhythm and nothing more by the famed American composer and Yale professor Horatio Parker, uh, to a music that would be celebrated by the Congress of the United States in 1987 through a joint resolution declaring, quote, jazz a rare and valuable national treasure, reflects the reconstructed and radically transformed America that Lincoln at least contemplated in his final days. The premise of my reading is rooted in another interpretation uh, of Lincoln's last public address, uh, delivered from the White House window on April 11th, 1865, hopefully with a slightly different twist to it. Lincoln's last words uh, to the gathered crowd addressed the challenge of Reconstruction and look forward, look toward a future that he would never see. Framed by the broader goal of returning seceded states to the proper and practical relations with the Constitutional Union, Lincoln's last address focused on Louisiana and how to treat its reconstructed government. The reconstructed government of Louisiana in 1865 had satisfied the general requirements of Lincoln's contested 10% plan, constituency of 12,000, sworn loyalty to the Union, 
the state constitution that emancipated the enslaved, ratified the 13th Amendment, but also excluded the introduction of universal suffrage for African-American males, as been called for by radical Republicans within Lincoln's party. Fully aware that the reconstructed government of Louisiana fell far short of the bar set by the radical faction of his party, Lincoln asked the audience, can Louisiana be brought back into proper practical relations with the Union sooner by sustaining or discarding her new state government? For Lincoln, the answer was sustaining. Lincoln was pragmatic and recognized that you had to start somewhere. Louisiana was where Lincoln was willing to put his toe on the line and begin the long journey forward into the powerful headwinds of change. Lincoln argued, if, on the contrary, we recognize and sustain the new government of Louisiana, the converse of all this is made true. We encourage the hearts and nerve the arms of 12,000 to adhere to their work and to argue for it and to proselytize for it and to fight for it and feed it and grow it and ripen it to a complete success. The colored man, too, in seeing all united for him, is inspired with vigilance and energy and daring to the same end. Grant that he desires the elective franchise, will he not obtain it sooner by saving the already advanced steps towards it than by running backward over them? The connection between Lincoln's unfinished work in jazz grows out of what a complete success might have actually looked like. To use his metaphor, what kind of fowl would the nurtured egg produce? Semantically, the work to ripen Louisiana into a complete success was the work of 12,000 white men. But by investing their vigilance, energy, and daring into the work of those 12,000 white men to achieve that complete success, African Americans would find their path to the franchise. While Lincoln never clarified his vision of a complete success, by the extension of his comments, a complete success for Louisiana and the nation was one where blacks were equally able to exercise the right to vote alongside fellow whites. We've already dipped our toes into the perpetual debate regarding Lincoln's views on racial political equality and the degree to which he actually believed in the comments that he was making. My intention is not to dive back into those debates. Uh, in connecting jazz to Lincoln's unfinished work, I'm more interested in reframing and zooming out from discussions of equality to discussions of the exercise of power. We have to remember that equality describes a relationship between objects in a specific context. In the context of America's pluralist democratic institutions, the term equality has been treated as synonymous with the right to vote. The vote expresses the citizen's exercise of power. Lincoln's objective in his last speech to resource the seated states to their proper practical relations with the Union was to be accomplished in the sphere of American politics. But if we reframe the notion of Lincoln's complete success in that arena around the idea of African Americans getting access to power, his unfinished work becomes portable. Beyond the confines of Americans' political institutions, we can begin to look for that work in progress in other aspects of American life and culture. Jazz and the broad, racially diverse social community of musicians, listeners, dancers, promoters, producers, club owners, critics, and more uh, giving shape to the music institutions represents a location of American life and culture where Lincoln's unfinished work was performed. Between the start of the 20th century and the 1960s, the jazz community grew and ripened into an important cultural sphere in which African Americans were able to acquire and wield the power to shape that community's present, future, and past. To be fair, African Americans have been able to benefit from a tactical advantage in their effort to acquire power within the jazz community relative to other spheres of American life. Members of the jazz community have generally understood that the music uh, flowed from the black creative imagination. While black musicians controlled the production of jazz, communities organizing foci, 
beginning with the music's New Orleans birth in the 1890s, they lack the ability to define the music's meaning and dictate the circumstances of its performance. As the jazz community evolved over the next 70 years, not only did African Americans gain access to the power to influence the meaning uh, of jazz and jazz performance, they, by the late 1950s and early 1960s, had obtained what could be considered the penultimate power within a pluralist institution, uh, the power to exclude the participation of others, as demonstrated in the rise of Crow Jim discussions ripping through the jazz community. Did you kind of jump away from the script uh, to make sure I don't run out of time to kind of make this last, uh, for me, which is the most interesting point? Uh, it's really kind of tied to where jazz gets by the time you get to the 1950s, 1960s, and these debates over Crow Jim. A lot of them are anchored in the work that's being produced by people like Max Roach, like Abby Lincoln, 1960, 1961. Uh, they produced two jazz albums, We Insist, Freedom Now Suite, and Abby Lincoln Straight Ahead. Both have slogans of the civil rights movement as their titles, and they're both highly influenced by the climate of political activism emerging within the civil rights movement. The songs themselves on the album express feelings of Pan-African nationalism, and that began to make people within the jazz community, especially white counterparts in the jazz community, extremely uncomfortable for what that meant relative to their experience. In the review of Abby Lincoln Straight Ahead, and a lot of historians have talked about this particular review as being shaped by Abby Lincoln's gender identity uh, as an African-American woman, but Ira Gittler, uh, the reviewer for Downbeat Magazine, levied the charge at uh, Abby Lincoln as a professional Negro. And she used that as a, he used that as a charge against her to say that she was reaching out to a black and nationalist appeal as a way to sell more albums in the commercial marketplace. In the review, Gittler, partially quoting Lincoln, writes, when referring to holidays left alone, it's a song on the album, Miss Lincoln is quoted as saying, in a way, all these tunes are about Billy. They're about all of us. Gittler used that, that line to argue that because all of the musicians on the recording date, and therefore in the studio, were black, then Lincoln, through her comments, was consciously excluding white Americans from identifying with the song Left Alone. The passage that Gittler used to argue that Lincoln espoused an anti-white nationalist stance was printed in Straight Ahead's program notes. What's kind of ironic about this is that the program notes are penned by uh, white American jazz critic, uh, activist, uh, impresario, Nat Hentoff, who had to be in the room to hear Abby Lincoln make those comments, so it was not a room of exclusively African Americans, but I guess that point was lost on <laughs> Mr. Gittler. But the conversation, the review, uh, sparked a huge debate within the jazz world uh, that prompted Downbeat Magazine, the leading jazz uh, trade uh, magazine of the time, to publish a, a panel discussion called Racial Prejudice in Jazz in 1962. Uh, the panel was moderated by Downbeat editor Don D. Michael, included Gittler, uh, Nat Hentoff, the album's producer, uh, Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, and a few others. And this conversation became extremely interesting because it began to be steered away from the themes of civil rights, of equality that were being addressed in the works of Abby Lincoln, of Max Roach, to this really interesting conversation about the exclusion of white Americans within jazz. And the title of the uh, discussion itself, Racial Prejudice in Jazz, begins to hint at that. Right? It was the racial prejudice of people like Abby Lincoln who were threatening to push the Don D. Michaels, the Ira Gittlers, the many white fans out of the jazz community. And it really helped to kind of highlight this, this sense of anxiety that white Americans felt uh, within the jazz community as jazz musicians became more politically engaged with the civil rights movement. Max Roach and Abby Lincoln were not alone. Uh, Miles Davis, Art Blakey were also accused of Jim Crow Jim practices and their hiring, if you will. Uh, and so thinking about that and kind of thinking about how jazz might connect to Abraham Lincoln, just kind of made me think about uh, Lincoln's letter, March 1864 letter to Louisiana Reconstructed Governor Michael Hahn, and the conversation about the possibility of extending voting rights, extending the franchise to African Americans in that state. And Lincoln uses terms like, or phrases as, barely suggest for your consideration. But this is only a suggestion, uh, but to you alone. 
So it really begins to highlight the way in which Lincoln uh, was giving Hahn complete subjective authority to decide who got the chance to, to vote within Louisiana. And kind of thinking about that, juxtaposed against the Crow Jim debates that are taking place in jazz, there seems to be this, this odd parallel. And so that's something that I began to think about and begin to explore within this paper. We need to kind of highlight these moments in which African Americans within the jazz community began to gain the power to define and direct the course of the music and the community surrounding it. So I'd like to spend the rest of this paper discussing a few key moments that propel a narrative of jazz history driven by race and power that take us from dismissing jazz as naked African rhythm uh, and no more to a moment when white, white Americans express their sincere concern about the anxiety uh, being pushed out of the jazz community by their African American counterparts. In doing so, it's worth noting that the circumstances of the Civil War and the failure of the First Reconstruction were in part responsible for the birth of jazz itself. In 1860, the 1862 capture and occupation of the Confederacy's largest city initiated New Orleans brass band culture and the movement of African Americans from the rural plantations to the city unleashed by emancipation brought the blues to New Orleans. Combined with the legacy of early 19th century ring shouts and the presence of the city's many opera and concert halls, military brass bands and the work songs of sugar plantations identified the separate musical strands that combined to form jazz music. The beginning of the Jim Crow era, following the collapse of Reconstruction, helped to mash those musical strands together as New Orleans Creole population was forced into African American neighborhoods, largely tied to the legislative code of 1894 that began to describe and define any person of African descent a Negro. So you saw all these communities begin to come together, and as Creole musicians interacted with African American musicians, these musical ideas began to merge, and this New Orleans music was largely created. But when it was first created, African Americans lacked the power and ability to control the circumstances of its production. Because the music was racially coded as a black form, it, added, it was added to the array of comedic skits in blackface minstrel stage a predominant form of entertainment at the moment. The original Creole jazz band, uh, the first group credited for carrying jazz outside the borders of the Crescent City, uh, performed for audiences in Hattiesburg and Gulfport, Mississippi, dressed as field hands from pre-war plantations. As late as the 1920s, 1930s, with Duke Ellington performing at the Cotton Club, he did so on stage, performing behind a line of hypersexualized, fair-skinned African-American women uh, dressed in little more than long feathers designed to conjure the African-American primitive at the Cotton Club. Not only did African-Americans not have the power to determine the meaning that, that the music created, as Nadir descended upon African-Americans following the collapse of Reconstruction, powerfully guided by fierce miscegenation, jazz became the oral symbol of the threat that blackness posed to white America. Uh, jazz emerged in into intellectual climate influenced by eugenicist theories, positing that the black race was inherently inferior to whites. Uh, the immensely popular 1914 film, Birth of a Nation, began to demonstrate that. The music's reputation had been predetermined and was quickly defined as the oral manifestation of vice. Uh, the reputation was so bad that New Orleans Times began published an 1819 article that disavowed the city's reputation as the birthplace of jazz music. Uh, but this also extended to the progressive movement. Uh, before a speech uh, to the National Education Association, writer and educator Henry Van Dyke described jazz as a species of music invented by demons for the torment of imbeciles. Black progressive organizations had to keep jazz music at an arm's distance. It cut against their goal of trying to demonstrate that African Americans were worthy of racial equality. Uh, at a dance held by the NAACP uh, featuring the Fletcher Henderson Band, they made the distinct point in their advertising mm -hmm. that the music Fletcher Henderson was going to play was not jazz music. Things begin to change, though, in the 1930s largely tied to the emergence within the historiography of jazz. 1935, just really quickly, uh, we have the first jazz history being written by a Frenchman, a French critic, uh, Hugh Panisse, titled Le Jazz Hot. And it becomes the, the, really the ground zero of jazz historiography. But in that text, what he begins to do is, is validate the aesthetic quality of jazz music. But he does so in a way that also seeks to deracialize it. Uh, they begin to talk about the notion that 
I'll just cut, quote him really quickly. That musicians like Bix Biedebex and Buggy Spanner, two white musicians, were also responsible for helping to chart hot jazz's future direction, that in adopting the Negro style, they unconsciously brought to it certain purely musical qualities from their superior culture. This does not mean that they civilized the Negro style or sterilized it. They eliminated from their playing none of the wild Negro spontaneity. They simply perfected its form. Panacea's book both aesthetically validated jazz and attempted to divorce blackness from its future development. So the following year, African-American critic Elaine Locke uh, wrote a book called The Negro in His Music, which captured and seized upon the way in which Hugh Panacea began to validate jazz as a form, but he worked to reconnect it with blackness. In many ways, using that as a flashpoint, as a starting point to begin to build the narrative of African-American jazz musicians serving as race men in race women as symbols of African-American achievement and as lines of evidence to demonstrate um, their worthy of equality in other aspects of American life. If I had more time, I would go on and talk about the bebop revolution and how that began to mark another moment in which African-Americans gained the ability and the power to really shape jazz's future and its direction. Um, but I'll just kind of wrap into a conclusion and just kind of end kind of following up with Dr. Burton's uh, prescription from last night to, to begin to shift, if you will, the conversation back towards optimism. And I really do see the jazz community and jazz culture as an example of un Lincoln's unfinished work being successful. It becomes uh, an optimistic story. Uh, we have it being validated as a, as a national treasure. We are building, we've seen the construction of $131 million Frederick P. Rose Hall at Lincoln Center. Uh, so it is a music that has been validated and it, it's a uh, multiracial pluralist sphere where we've moved past debates upon race and inclusion, but it's not to say that there aren't new challenges to tackle. In many ways, participation is limited in different ways. Uh, socioeconomics, more so than race, begins to frame the ability to become a jazz musician. As we watch the decline in music education in secondary schools, that begins to erode a pipeline to jazz musicianship. As becoming a professional jazz musician now goes through college, access to college becomes another important thing that needs to be addressed as well. Now, I'll stop there. Hope to me I can uh, just talk more about this in the, the Q and A phase. But thank you uh, for your time. Final speaker is Matthew Long about whom I have no anecdotal information, other than he's a graduate student in the master's program at Clemson University. And if he's never tailgated in the graduate student office or gone up on the roof, he's probably not a super grad student like we were. He earned his bachelor's degree from University of Pittsburgh, majoring in Germanic studies, language, literature, and he received a certificate in West European studies. His interests include the cultural history of the Southern United States, digital humanities, and Central European political and cultural history. Long's thesis work will explore transnational and comparative political history surrounding myth, myth-making, and nationalism in interwar Germany, Italy, and the United States. And I think his paper is going to be a good pairing to Dr. Gaffney's paper. So let's welcome Mr. Long. Thank you so much. <clears throat> And there will be a little bit of overlap here, so uh, forgive any uh, repeats. Uh, first off, thank you so much to Dr. Burton and Dr. Eisenstadt for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity, particularly to uh, present to such an esteemed audience. Um, this paper and corresponding website, if I don't run out of time, I will show you the, uh, the website. And um, if I do run out of time and you're interested, please let me know, because I'd be happy to share it with you uh, after the session. Uh, but this is the uh, culmination of a, a semester-long digital historical methods uh, project that I did for Drs. Uh, Burton and Drs. Pa uh, Drs. Burton and Dr. Pam Mack, who's also here in the audience today. Um, so I will uh, talk today briefly on the early history of Black New Orleans uh, and the rise of mutual aid and the jazz tradition uh, of the, the second line and the so-called mutual and pleasure aid societies, mutual aid and pleasure societies. <clears throat> By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, race relations in the United States had sunk to what many consider a nadir, 
The promise of reconstruction for the new American South, along with burgeoning political rights and economic opportunities for black Americans, most freed from slavery less than a generation prior, collided in spectacular fashion with the systemic reassertion of white supremacy through the guise of Jim Crow, segregation, and the political subjugation of non-whites through violence and political chicanery. The rise of the Klan across the American South coincided with the gradual reinstatement of Democratic Party controls of local, county, and state governments, in large part a concerted and oftentimes violent uh, effort between the two. Uh, historians uh, Edward Ayers, Michael Perman, and others describe how conservative Democrats redeemed the South from Reconstruction governments and Republican administrations, and how in steady fashion, conservative Democrats reclaimed control in state and local governments from Virginia to Texas following Appomattox. These so-called Redeemer Democrats in their campaigns to retake the levers of government, uh, among them more than a few could claim military service on behalf of the Confederacy. Ayers writes that John Brown Gordon of Georgia, LQC Lamar of Mississippi, Wade Hampton of South Carolina, these embodied the democratic ideal of the citizen soldier determined to, re determined to reclaim his homeland from northern Republican interlopers. Across the South, white veterans with education and property stepped forward to seize the power they considered theirs. Under democratic rule, they promised, political bloodshed would cease, race relations would calm, the economy would flourish, and honor in government would prevail. I don't know if this sounds, uh, if this rings a bell to anyone. To be sure, systemic and oftentimes violent racism would predominate across all of the United States during this period. Further, it would clearly be a mistake to ascribe the entirety of racial animus onto the states of the American South alone. <clears throat> Yet it was precisely in the American South where violence and the subjugation of blacks was most thoroughly ingrained, where the greatest number of lynchings would occur, and where attempts to disenfranchise African Americans would be most pervasive. As state and federal governments would fail to protect their most basic of human rights, African Americans of this period would therefore look toward one another to meet their needs. They would seek their own health care and protections through self-reliance and mutual aid. They would carve out of a larger white society a space of their own, and in so doing, create a path toward an independent culture through creative self-expression. Uh, thanks to Professor Hine, too, that was... Uh... Nowhere was this cultural self-expression and creativity on better display than in New Orleans. The cultural heritage of blacks and Creole New Orleanians uh, is an incredibly useful microcosm for understanding the experience of African Americans from the early republic through to the 21st century. Their experiences are both emblematic of and a counterpoint to the rest of the American South and country at large. The historiography of New Orleans is certainly complicated, but the literature tends to emphasize the distinctive qualities of the city, all those things that made, in some, New Orleans such a unique city when compared to the region and nation at large. However, my thesis rests at least on, in part on continuity. I would argue that a myriad of factors, many of them culturally distinct from the city's surroundings, but many others culturally similar, would combine to create a jazz culture uh, of the Crescent City that is so well known and celebrated today. Ad uh, Adam Fairclaw reminds us that in spite of all the differences uh, of the city, uh, in spite of, quote, its easygoing hedonism, New Orleans affirmed white supremacy no less avidly than cities in Alabama and, or Georgia and that, moreover, Protestant Louisiana was culturally indistinguishable from the rest of the South and scarcely seemed more hospitable to blacks than the neighboring Arkansas and Mississippi. Indeed, biographers and historians will often note that it is precisely because of rampant, suffocating racism in the early years of the 20th century that would cause many of Jazz's pioneers to flee the city. They would all return eventually, of course, but pianist Jolly, Jelly Roll Morton, clarinetist Sidney Bechet, and trumpeter Louis Armstrong would leave the famed nightclubs of Storyville on the border of Creole downtown and Black Uptown and successfully seek careers as far away as New York, Los Angeles, and in the capitals of Europe. Writes Alan Lomax about Jelly Roll, he was restless. He could not be content with his music because jazz for him was a power, a way out of a narrow valley of Jim Crow and Creole prejudice he began to look away from New Orleans, wondering if, they, uh, if he had the key to a larger world. Jelly Roll and his colleagues would be among the first in a long tradition of musicians who would project the cultural import of New Orleans music to the rest of the world. Uh, and I, I would reflect here, too, to say that um, a, a number of historians, and uh, I think most famously Wynton Marsalis, has made the point that the improvisation of jazz would mirror the improv improvisation that blacks would have to use to get through life in a, uh, a suffocating racist South, uh, and, and that jazz gave hope and a creative outlet to the blacks that were uh, involved in making it. Um, so I think that's a really important point that I wanted to kind of emphasize and underline there. <clears throat> 
In this paper, then, I will explore the story of black New Orleans, the formation of mutual aid societies, and the second line jazz tradition that grew out of that tradition. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the second line jazz tradition that grew out of them. Uh, and this being a musical form that retains many of its original elements, which continues unabated to this day. The black experience was integral to New Orleans history from the very beginning. 1719 saw the first large group of Africans arrive to the burgeoning French city, commencing what would become 140 years of slavery in the region. The 1724 Code Noirs codified the subjugation of black Africans under their white masters through the establishment of a formal slave code in the French colony. The code also stipulated that all slaves in the colony convert to Roman Catholicism and allowed for the possibility that slaves could purchase their own freedom, something that was uh, among the slave codes relatively liberal at the time. Richard Campanella draws a distinction between the experience of black slaves in the, in the French and British realms of North America. He writes, racial identities and relationships became more complex and fluid in Caribbean-influenced French Louisiana compared to that of Anglo-North America. This distinction would prove important in the development of a black culture that was markedly different from those of other blacks in the southern United States. But again, we see that there are similarities there too. A glimpse of these uh, experiences of African Americans in New Orleans is offered uh, further by Lawrence N. Powell in his book, The Accidental City, Improvising New Orleans. He writes, on Sundays after mass, slaves would spill out into the public spaces of the Plaza de Mas to display not only their wares, but themselves. Sunday market was the time set aside for dressing to the nines, showing off with sag swagger and strut, up to the moment fads in clothing and hairstyles, from turbans of many colors to rainbows of ribbons and almost everything had been accessorized to underscore not just vestiges of an African identity, but of an unvanquished individuality. And you see uh, uh, some early prints there of uh, uh, a similar market that would have been uh, the case in, in a place like Congo Square in New Orleans. The earliest Louisiana slaves were largely captured and sold out of their Senegambia homeland in West Africa. In their new surroundings on a new continent, they maintained strong tribal identities, as well as a common language and culture. Later, slaves and free blacks came to Louisiana via French Haiti, Spanish Cuba, and other islands of the Caribbean, incorporating into the New Orleans black culture a distinctive Creole tradition. Sundays in Catholic New Orleans were significant. Mandated by scripture as a day of rest, many masters gave their slaves time off to attend church and to spend the day with their families with relatively little oversight. In spite of early attempts to control this practice, many slaves took to congregating on Sundays in public squares to barter and sell their goods in informal markets, and to relax, dance, sing, drum, and make music as they might have in their homelands. Improvised instruments were constructed out of local materials to mimic the sounds of Afro-Caribbean instruments, including calabash and other gourds turned to jembes and proto-banjos. Gwendolyn Midlow Hall describes the effect that New Orleans had become by the mid-19th century the most African city in the United States. And perhaps no public space in the entirety of New Orleans had more cultural and historical significance in this regard than Congo Square. And we see, uh, uh, again, a print from uh, early 19th century there, slaves uh, dancing the bambula, and then today uh, this tradition carries on as well, still in Congo Square. Congo Square was situated on a sacred ancient Indian site, and it functioned as an outdoor slave market during the earliest years of the colony. Today, its location marks the boundary between the French Quarter and the Faubourg Treme neighborhoods. Over the years, it would be known variously as Place de Negres, Place Publique, Circus Square, and then by act of the Louisiana legislature in 1893, uh, Beauregard Square, in memorial to Confederate General PGT Beauregard. But ultimately, by the mid-20th century, uh, the area would regain the name Congo Square. The Code Noir gave specific mention to the square as a place where slaves could gather, drum, and dance on Sundays, and sometimes hundreds at a time would do so. Music historians uh, describe what would later become known as ring shout, uh, wherein small groups of instrumentalists, singers, and dancers would arrange themselves in circles uh, around a constantly rotating cast of soloists. Uh, and you see in this, you see in this ring shout tradition the beginnings of uh, uh, improv improvisation jazz um, with soloists uh, having individuality amongst a collective. Drumming and dancing in the square retained many of the African musical, cultural, and dance elements of the tribes represented from Western and Central Africa, but also took on a spiritual voodoo elements from the West Indies. Dancing, drumming, and the Sunday markets continued as Sunday traditions through the beginning of the Civil War. 
Today, Tong Congo Square is widely regarded as the birthplace of jazz, as well as myriad other forms of African-American music, and its location within Louis Armstrong Park and the National Park Service's New Orleans Jazz Historical Park are testament to this. <clears throat> Speaking of ring shout, Samuel A. Floyd writes, they were all the defining elements of black music, call and response devices, additive rhythms and polyrhythms, timbral distortions of various kinds, musical individuality within collectivity, and the metronomic foundational pulse that underlies all African-American music. Music and dance commingled, merged, and fused to become a distinctive cultural ritual. Uh, scholars Hirsch and Logston summarized New Orleans in the 19th century uh, by suggesting that the city functioned, we talked about this uh, as a foil to the rest of the United States. During most of the 19th century, New Orleans remained in counterpoint to the rest of urban America. Newcomers recoiled when they encountered the prevailing French language of the city, its dominant Catholicism, its body sensual delights, or its proud, free, black population. In short, its deeply rooted Creole traditions. Its incorporation into the United States posed a profound challenge, the infant republic's first attempt to impose its institutions on a foreign city. Uh, this is a uh, print from Harper's Magazine. This is circa 1863. Uh, funeral for deceased Captain Andrew Callio, who was captain of the E Company, the first Louisiana Native Guard, uh, an all-black unit comprised of educated, wealthy, free men of color, uh, and you see it's very small, but you can see in the very left-hand corner here a, a brass band that's uh, leading the funeral uh, cotier. And um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. Even in a nation inclined, uh, uh, sorry, pardon me. Uh, even in a nation inclined to constantly form associations, as Alexi de Tocqueville observed in 1831, residents of New Orleans excelled in organizing lodges, religious groups, literary societies, charitable organizations, sporting clubs, social clubs, and most of all, benevolent societies, the most popular and practical organization to which the polyglot population mm -hmm. flocked. Uh, that's from uh, uh, Leslie Gale Parr in her article, Sundays in the Streets. By the mid-19th century, New Orleans had become one of the most cosmopolitan cities in all of North America. A major port city and the largest and most important city in the southern United States, it was second only to New York in terms of net immigration between the years uh, 1837 and 1860. New Orleans attracted 52,000 immigrants during 1851 alone, which was equal to new uh, rivals that year in Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore combined. Between 1820 and 1860, over half a million newcomers made their way to America via the port of New Orleans. Immigrants during this period hailed from all over the world and left their cultural imprint on the city. Uh, Leslie Parr describes how by 1850, this mixture of older and newer rivals, French, Spanish, Africans, English, Germans, Irish, Greeks, Swiss, Portuguese, Italians, Cubans, Filipinos, Mexicans, Croats, Slavs, Chinese, Sicilians, and others, produced the fifth largest and one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the United States. Yet as New Orleans grew to be one of the most important and cosmopolitan American cities, the city's efforts in the area of public health were unable to keep pace with the large influx of immigrants. Further prevailing attitudes around the topic of social aid and welfare stifled public investment in relief programs for the poor and destitute of New Orleans. Social historians like Elizabeth Wisner argue that this largely arose out of Roman Catholic beliefs of the city's earliest settlers who considered the church and private property to be the primary caretaker of the city's poor. Even as yellow fever ravaged the city in 1820, the city's mayor, while acknowledging the desperate situation, nevertheless professed that, quote, in circumstances so grave and injurious, public benevolence is much less effective and less powerful than private charity. Relative to neighboring southern states, Louisiana did not pass legislation requiring public aid for the states impoverished until very late in 1880. And in subsequent years, New Orleans would lag behind nearly every other major city in amount spent per capita on public welfare. An 1899 report found that New Orleans' investment in aid programs to be, quote, trifling, at about three cents per person. And as late as 1930, this trend had still continued. Uh, Richard Campanella writes, New Orleans would become the nation's filthiest, least healthy, most death-prone major city for much of the 19th century, a fact oftentimes denied or covered up by the city's commercial interests. At the same time, there was no shortfall of disease and unsanitary conditions within the city proper. Wisner attributes this in large part to New Orleans being a major port in a semi-tropical climate near the mouth of the Mississippi River, where shipping and epidemic disease were closely associated. 
Similar ports in the American South, including Savannah, Charleston, Mobile, and Natchez, all would experience occasional epidemics during this period, but no city matched New Orleans for the intensity uh, that scourges of yellow fever, cholera, typhus, malaria, ship fever, and smallpox would regularly visit upon the city's populace. Leslie Gale Parr reports that the local government's investment in sanitation was completely lacking, and municipal piped water, uh, drinking water, was filthy, causing many people drinking from open cisterns of rainwater. Um, I won't continue to tell you how horrible it was, but um, I think you get the picture. Um, not surprisingly, immigrant and black communities suffered disproportionately from these developments. Rates of mortality for poor and working class African Americans were particularly high during the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, back to uh, Leslie Gale Parr, she summarizes, often living in crowded quarters with few sanitation services, drinking unsanitary water, having little access to health care, and excluded because of their race from most charitable institutions, African Americans suffered significantly more health problems and higher death rates than whites. And it was only natural then that uh, in this environment, African Americans would seek out opportunities for mutual aid. In the period between the end of the Civil War through the 1880s, uh, more than 226 such benevolent associations formed in New Orleans alone. The organizations were based on the idea that dues-paying members would support one another in times of financial hardship and beyond for all manner of social welfare services, including lodge practice-style health care, uh, retirement pensions, medical and life insurance, and funeral and burial benefits. Perhaps equally important, such organizations provided for the spiritual and social needs of the community. David Bieto writes, the aid dispensed through governments and organized charities during the late 19th and early 20th centuries was not only minimal, but carried a great stigma. On the other hand, benevolent societies would allow Americans to provide social welfare services that could be had no other way. Fraternal aid rested on the ethical principle of reciprocity. Donors and recipients often came from the same or nearly the same walks of life. Today's recipient could be tomorrow's donor and vice versa. Um, again, in the interest of time, I will uh, skip ahead a little bit here, uh, but just want to make a point that, um, particularly among the African American community, that lodge style practice was a very important part of it. Uh, many, as uh, Professor Hine pointed out earlier, many uh, professional doctors uh, would would serve in these lodge uh, practices to give the uh, healthcare that was needed to the communities. <clears throat> All right, let's just skip to the bands. You see, New Orleans was very organization-minded. I've never seen such beautiful clubs as they had there. The Broadway Swells, the High Arts, the Orleans Aids, the Blue Bulls and the Bears, the Tramps, the Iroquois, the Allegros. That was just a few of them. And those clubs would parade at least once a week. They'd have a great big band. The Grand Marshal would ride in front of his aides behind him, all with expensive sashes and streamers. That's Jelly Roll Morton. In his seminal work in New Orleans, The Formative Years, Henry Commend emphasizes that parades and bands were integral to the social fabric of New Orleans from almost the earliest days. It began early and grew fast, this romance between New Orleans and parades. The historical record shows that as early as 1787, the Spanish governor Esteban Rodriguez Miro decided to entertain a visiting delegation of 36 Choctaw and Chickasaw chiefs with parades through the town center. As the city grew, so grew the musical forms. Military bands, drum and fife corps, veteran bands, and other neighborhood ensembles formed at a rigorous pace during the antebellum years. Naturally, mutual aid societies and a growing community of immigrant groups would add their own musical influence to the mix. Even outside of the Mardi Gras and Carnival traditions for which New Orleans would become most famous, the early days of the colonies witnessed parades for all manner of public events. National holidays, days of remembrance, religious holidays, elections, weddings, and funerals. But when it came right down to it, Commend writes, good weather on a Sunday was the only excuse needed to turn out the bands. Um, in a city as obsessively connected to its musical traditions as was New Orleans, it was only fitting to send off the dead with a parade. Parr reports that as early as the 1830s, military organizations and benevolent societies were routinely burying their dead to, make, uh, to the music of a brass band. The Daily Picayune described a funeral parade in 1852. In what would become exceedingly common practice, a brass ba band led the procession, followed by an open drawn horse carriage uh, containing an American flag draped coffin with a procession of society members and mourners who knew the dead following behind. Um, so I will, uh, okay, a couple more minutes. Um, I, I do have a quote that I, I would 
uh, like to read to you, and again, you can find this paper on my website too, which I'll, I'll, I'll share with you if, uh, if you're interested. I'd be happy to send a link to anyone. Um, but to, to follow on, um, uh, discuss a little bit about this second line uh, tradition, uh, I have a quote at length here from, from Helen Regis that I think is really helpful. The term second line is ambiguous. It refers to the dance steps, which are performed by club members and their followers during parades. It also refers to a distinctive syncopated rhythm that is said to have originated in the streets of New Orleans. More importantly, second line means the followers or joiners who fall in behind the first line, composed of the brass band and the social club, which typically sponsors the parade. Second liners are a massive and heterogeneous group of individuals drawn from all walks of life. The distinctive interaction between the club members, musicians, and second liners produces a dynamic participatory event in which there is no distinction between audience and performer. In fact, watching such a parade is practically impossible, as the massive crowd surrounding the club and band obscures the view, and any bystanders are insistently urged to join in the parade. It is only by plunging into the crowd that one can begin to apprehend the complex experiential reality of the line. Uh, and I would just point out that even to this day, uh, funerals, jazz funerals in New Orleans that involve these second line parades, they still average about one per day. So this continues to go on, these mutual and pleasure aid societies, uh, mutual aid and pleasure societies continue to, to do this. Uh, and then this last quote is up here, is from Michael White uh, in his uh, essay, Reflections on, on, on an Authentic Jazz Life. Doc and the older band members taught me that, at least in the neighborhoods, jazz was not the same as tourist music. It was a musical accompaniment to a way of life, an expression of community spirit that permeated dancing, speech, cooking, mannerisms, dress, walking, wit, and humor. And over the years of many memorable engagements, I come to appreciate, I came to appreciate the strong spiritual and cultural ties between the local African American community, West African customs, and European traditions. Thank you very much. If you got one of those. Uh... Could I just follow up um, with both Nicholas and uh, indeed with Matt? Um, uh, Kate Mazier, who's left um, mid-morning, but, um, I, I, but I think she might have um, echoed my question, which is if you remember her presentation on John Washington and they knew Lincoln, and how John Washington, in fact, had uh, uh, sought to disinter the stories of, of, of black people who had known Lincoln. Um, as, in some ways, a way of holding off the changes that were he, he saw around him, and particularly the, uh, the, the black youth that were turning to jazz. <laughs> so in this case, Lincoln is not an... Uh, you use Lincoln as an expression, <laughs> as, or as a, as a kind of... They've seen jazz as an expression of um, um, a segment of black society um, establishing itself and uh, getting some kind of dig dignity. Um, for John Washington, jazz was working in the <laughs> opposite direction, and I wonder if you could say something about that kind of that cross-generational problem. Yeah. So it's, it's... Oh, there we go. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, uh, but the case with Washington is not unique. And there does seem to be like a generational trend uh, within that. And I, I kind of talk about that in the, the book project I'm slowly kind of working on. Uh, but to try to explain why uh, organizations like the NAACP uh, really work to keep jazz at arm, why it is that they're saying Fletcher Henderson is not a jazz band. And I think you have to keep in mind that, you know, people like Du Bois, who played a large role in kind of shaping the cultural programs that the NAACP pursued in its early years, uh, born in the, the 18, I think 1868, really kind of had his, his kind of musical preferences established in a moment when jazz just did not exist. Uh, as the NAACP had first begun to, to emerge as the Urban League, these black progressive organizations came into existence, a lot of the members probably had not even heard jazz uh, because it was slow to begin to expand uh, out of New Orleans. You don't really see the first groups that begin to go on tour, like the Jelly Roll Mortons or the Creole, original Creole Jazz Band, really beginning to branch out uh, until the first decade of the, the 1900s. So there is a, a like a, maybe a, a, a generational thing uh, kind of at play there where by the time kind of du Bois does become aware of jazz, uh, the, the meaning that's invested in it completely contradicts the political project in which he's invested. Uh, and it's not just Du Bois or the, 
the kind of integrationist uh, kind of aspect of, uh, I guess, the, the early kind of freedom struggle, which we have to think more about the term integration. But you even see this in Marcus Garvey's UNIA. I mean, they hate jazz, too, uh, for very similar reasons. It's maybe one of the only things they, they kind of agree on uh, <laughs> very early on. But it, it, within, the, within the NAACP, uh, you do begin to see things change in the 1930s. Uh, after kind of Elaine Locke publishes that book, you find the NAACP uh, publishing a profile about Duke Ellington, uh, but the editor had changed. It's no longer Du Bois calling the shots at Crisis Magazine. It's Roy Wilkins, who is a contemporary of all these, these emerging jazz musicians. I mean, he kind of cuts his teeth hanging out in jazz clubs in Kansas City and Minnesota. So you, there is a... I guess I'm, I'm afraid to really go out there and map this into generation, but there definitely seems to be a correlation there. You might mention uh, my poem uh, by Julian Bond. Uh, yeah, so I mean, to, to even extend that, I mean, when you talk about Julian Bond kind of coming of age in the, the context of the bebop revolution, he publishes an article in, uh, in Snicks magazine, I forget the exact year, but really talking about how Charlie Parker, how Dizzy Gillespie are really kind of helping him to sustain protest. I can't remember the, it's a very good poem. I wish I wouldn't try to recount it here, but that's the message, I suppose. I by heart, I, you <laughs> taught me, but it's something like Ode to Jazz, isn't the poem? Yeah, so I think it kind of ends like hearing Charlie Parker kind of relaxing at uh, Caramello gives me the power to, to stand here a little bit longer. Charlie Parker got locked up uh, and put in the same asylum in California because uh, he was running through a hotel naked. Uh, by accident, I guess, but <laughs> there goes the story. <laughs> yeah, we had some of that at the Abernathy, but we'll, yeah. we'll <laughs> Catherine. Since we are talking about linking the past and the present, and I think this venue gives us an opportunity to do that, I'm going to ask Darlene to comment a little bit more on how today we start looking back in the past and finding some usable things. So looking at the way in which women in the wake of freedom sought health care, you know, linking that seems good. So I'm just wondering how that influenced your thinking and or reparations, if you could comment more on that. Because I really have been so stimulated to try and think more about the links that people are making here, past, present, for a more hopeful future. I think, I think the, the best thing that I can say or underscore is that health care, from the very beginning of their arrival on, you know, this, this continent was critical uh, to black women and, and to black men. And there's this, there's this long, long history of them trying to invent potions and do all kinds of things just to stay alive. And um, when we get to, to the 20th century, I, I just, in my research, just witnessed this explosion of interest in establishing institutions of collecting money to send people to different locations to acquire learning. And at the same time, we're often thinking about health care for black people as being this man-made kind of thing uh, where the women would develop potions and that's it and whatever. But, but they were really concerned with modernizing, if you will, the delivery of health care. Um, and I think one of the one of the people I wanted to talk to, she sort of encapsulated so much of what I'm saying and the way I feel was Maud um, Callan, uh, and she should be very familiar to the people here at Clemson uh, because she gave her an honorary doctorate degree. Um, for her outstanding lifelong work in helping um, women deliver healthy children, um, taking care to in fight the state for inoculations for black people in these poor rural communities when the state departments of health 
didn't even want to go out there and acknowledge them unless there was some kind of epidemic. But there was Maud Callan, who found a, a, a cohort, a, a, a colleague in Hill Sheriff, I believe, and began to negotiate all kinds of ways to uh, secure uh, health care and inoculation and all kinds of things just to keep the black people in um, Berkeley County alive. And finally, the point that uh, about, about her that I think most people may be familiar with was when W. Eugene Smith took the picture of her, that five page spread, and, and testified about how Maude Callan was keeping people alive, um, and people all over the world, Italy, you name it, started sending all this money to Maude Callan, and then she had to fight to keep it because the state was saying, well, the, the health department was saying, well, that money belongs to us. And, and uh, he intervened, and they gave her the money, and she built a clinic. And now it is uh, being renovated, and there's a little museum out there in Berkeley County, uh, the Maude Callan Clinic. But for 50 years, she was the only lifeline that most of the people in, in um, uh, Berkeley County had. So. Professor Hine, what did you find in, the, in this people, I'm struggling with this echo, the women that you studied, did they write at all about what it cost them to work with white women in the white establishment, how much they had to be subservient or you know, accept disrespect? Uh, or did they, was part of being professional, never to talk about that? They didn't write it down. At least I haven't found. Um, any written documents that deeply explore the, the psychodynamics of their relationships. But I do know that they needed white women and white women needed them. Um, and that there was a lot of, as I've said before, there was a lot of violence going on in these white women's households and a lot of black women maids and young girls working in these households and sometimes um, uh, babies would appear that uh, Maud and, and of course uh, especially Evans delivered and the family was in a dilemma. Who's going to take care of this? How we're going to handle this? And uh, Maud um, Maud and um, Matilda both ended up with some biracial children that they took care of, adopted, uh, and what have you. And it was just assumed uh, that, of course, they were uh, legitimate parts of the family, if you will. There's a lot of sexual dynamics going on that these women were not writing about. It's just that when, as I, I'll tell you, I'll give you one example. I'm sitting in my office at uh, Northwestern. I received a phone call. This is, you know, years ago. I received a phone call. A woman says, I'd like to speak to Dr. Hine. I said, I'm, it's, you're speaking to her. She says, um, are you going to sit down? Are you seating? Are you sitting down, whatever? And I said, well, yes, I'm sitting down. And she said, well, um, I just want you to know that I'm related to uh, um, Matilda Evans. And um, I said, you are? And she said, you're writing a book on her, aren't you? And I said, yes, I'm trying to. And she said, well, I'm going to send you some pictures of uh, 
of some of the kids and some of my relatives and what have you. And she sent me these pictures. And I was glad I was sitting down at that time because these pictures of these children were about as fair complex you could imagine. They were mixed, they were definitely mixed race. And these were children that she had adopted and, uh, and ed educated and were part of that very extended family, her family now. Um, and I was very happy that she sent me those uh, items, those, those photographs, those images. Uh, but it sort of stifled me because I really did not know how to integrate this into the story that I was trying to tell. And I'm still working on it. And she calls every now and then. Uh, she's in her 80s. So this one woman to ask me how I'm doing and um, if I plan to finish the book before she dies. <laughs>